Hello everyone, this is Dr. Anwar Masood from DRK Palm Solution. Firstly, I'd like to thank CRDM for giving us the opportunity to participate in Rail Summit 2021. Quickly, I will go through my presentation. Uh, initially, I will talk about what DRK Palm Solution is uh, doing in, in the Southeast Asian part of the world and follow to that uh, uh, the situation of rare disease in this region as well. The ERK Pharma Solution is a premier solution provided to the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industries. So research and focus in the Southeastern region. The ERK has been providing its clinical research services in Pakistan. We have two offices in Pakistan, one based in Lahore and the other one is based in Karachi from where I am. Asian region more shows high incidence of rates of non-communicable and communicable diseases, making the region extremely effective place for conducting clinical trials. And the, and the reason why there is a, a very uh, much development in the regulatory environment in the South Asian um, part of the world. Uh, in Pakistan, BioStudy in 2017 is an excellent start by the Drug Regulatory Authority uh, of Pakistan. And, but the key advantages of conducting clinical trials in the Southeast Asia is the firstly the availability of huge numbers of patients, treatment naive patients. And so the recruitment, the recruitment uh, is very fast paced. The cost is comparatively very low to the western part, uh, west part of the world. It's, there are multiple GM, GCP compliance sites available for conducting clinical trials. The PI, the clinical, the clinicians are UK and US trained. And lack of regulatory hurdles and central lab logistics and cold chain availability. ERKs provide full CRO services in this uh, Southeast Asia, starting from the clinical trial facility visibility management, the monitoring, the static analysis, data management, uh, support services, registries, and not to mention pharmacovigilance vigilance for um, safety and efficacy. Pakistan is a participant in multi centered international longitudinal observation program designed to track the natural history of outcomes of patients with grocery disease, February and PSI and Pompeii. In the best the incidence of rare disease taken to be one in every 5,000 births. But in countries where the intermediate is at such a high rate, the incidence raises dramatically. For example, in Qatar, where the rate of intermarriage is 40%, cases of rare disease stand one in every 1,300. But in Pakistan, where intermarriage is really considered to be around 60%, we even have a very high accidents with, uh, all across the country. Which has the capacity and capability of conducting rare disease in the research. Uh, uh, there are a number of mentioned here. Uh, strategy and diagnosis in early intervention. Delays in diagnosis means that opportunity for timely interventions can be missed. Tools to reduce time it takes to diagnose a rare disease will be effective. Aware about new treatments for effective evaluation, there needs to be processes to let people know when new treatments become available. And genetic text testing, developing appropriate network for genetic testing should be there. And access to clinical trials will facilitate the unmet gap of treatment but also encourage uh, the prevention of rare disease as well. Further queries, you are most welcome to contact us anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Omar Shed from Pakistan and talking about rare diseases in Pakistan and the potential for research and innovations. Um, brief intro about myself. Um, after training in UK, I can return to Pakistan in 2000. Um, Presently, uh, we have managed over the years, in 15, 16 years, establish uh, the first rare disease center in Pakistan and the first LSD diagnostic and treatment center at the Children's Hospital. Uh, I have the honor of receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society of Genetic and Rare Diseases. There are more than 7,000 rare diseases in the world <clears throat> and almost 350 million people worldwide suffer from these diseases. Though individually they may be rare, but collectively they may they affect one in 15 persons worldwide. Since 80% of these rare diseases are genetic, so overwhelmingly children are affected. And the large majority have no cure. Because of intermarriages and uh, consanguinity, um, every ethnic group has its own constellation of autosomal recessive genetic diseases. Pakistan, unfortunately, is a highly inbred community with cousin marriages and same caste marriages. 
And after infectious disease and malnutrition, the biggest killer in children is genetic diseases. And according to a conservative estimate in Pakistan, 50% mortality in infancy is from genetic diseases. But sadly, very poorly understood at the level of policymakers and also physicians caring for children. Now, the, even though the European Union defines a condition as rare if it affects fewer than one in 2000, there is high heterogeneity of rare diseases, both in etiology and in prevalence. And due to these large discrepancies in prevalence, the question about a rare disease might often not be, is it rare? But in any country, how rare is it? For instance, in Pakistan, with the consanguinity rate being 60% or even higher in some regions, the expected burden of genetic and rare diseases is very high. Some diseases which the West might consider very rare, like Wilson's or ABC before mutations, the prevalence is very high in Pakistan. And there is a huge burden of every sort of genetic disease in children. And they're very challenging to manage in Pakistan because uh, not only there are socioeconomic disparities across the region and no regional centers for rare diseases, there's a low medical awareness and these diseases are poorly taught both at the undergrad and postgrad level, consequently poorly understood by physicians who are caring for children. A lot, a lot of physicians are interested in diagnosing or managing them and most patients undergo a virtual health pilgrimage to seek the diagnosis and treatment and we call them, they're literally the health orphans. Successive governments have failed to implement a rare disease policy and large pharmaceuticals are actually more focused on drugs for common and infectious diseases. <clears throat> and there is a lack of momentum in addressing the unmet needs of these patients. Uh, we managed to set up the first rare disease diagnosis and treatment center in the liver unit in uh, 2013 at Children's Hospital. Now patients with rare diseases from all over the country come to this center, if it's a small center, which is housed in the GI unit, Genetic testing is offered in collaboration with our partners at Centrogene and our census Germany. Um, ERT is being given for Gaucher, Pompe, Hunters, MPS 1 and 6, though not all patients have access to this. And this, this is through charitable access programs. Uh, we are um, actively try engaging in um, importing um, orphan drugs like nitisinone and colic acid for patients with tyrosinemia and in bone error of bile salt metabolism. Uh, we first established a national core committee and set up a registry, a national registry and a database in our liver unit. But from 2019, we're now part of a global registry. We are partners now in the multinational clinical studies like Lysopro, Biometabol, Induced Pluripotent Stem Cells. And our rare disease center is the biggest collaborating partner in the biomarker studies um, and it includes 183 rare diseases. Um, we are commemorating the Rare Disease Day every February on a large scale um, in collaboration with physicians, patient advocacy groups. Um, and it's an initiative which has been taken to reframe the rare diseases in Pakistan, uh, to break down the silos and bring synergies and innovation and in research and development for Pakistan. Rare Diseases uh, Days highlights how to improve the situation of rare diseases in Pakistan by signifying how every patient counts. Now, if you look at this slide, uh, the red is where we actually are still lacking. Now, we have managed to build the infrastructure to analyze uh, the genetic causes of rare diseases. We do have now international charities and national charities who offer support. Um, we are doing the prenatal screening of um, families who have patients with their diseases and at risk groups. However, our Pakistan still lag behind in conducting clinical trials and the availability of new treatment modalities. Um, it, this is something where we are significantly behind. So I think uh, with the high prevalence of all genetic disorders in Pakistan due to the inbred nature of our community, most rare diseases are not so rare in Pakistan. The huge unmet need of treatment we need more focus on prevention as well as research and access to clinical trials. This will provide valuable scientific insight into development of new therapies, as well as give some hope for the untreated. Thank you very much.
Hello, and thank you so much for inviting me to do this talk at the CRDN 2021 conference. I'm going to focus on bringing genomics from the clinical, uh, uh, from the clinic to the community and specifically talking about phenotyping, sample collection, and biobanks. So a few vital statistics about Pakistan that you may already know, but it's important to highlight the challenges that we face as a country, uh, not only the size of the population, but the fact that the demographics uh, are such that we are a very young nation. Uh, we spend very little on healthcare. Uh, we have a large chunk of the population living under the poverty line. And on all these background challenges is the fact that 50 to 60 percent of our marriages are consanguineous within families, which leads to a huge burden of genetic disease for our population. And you know, when there are many, many other health problems like malnutrition and infectious diseases, a lack of women empowerment, uh, a lot of unrecognized uh, 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 newborn and child deaths, uh, uh, maybe due to genetic diseases, which, which we do not uh, currently uh, appreciate, in, uh, in uh, diseases such as cancer, where genetic testing should be a priority, it, it becomes uh, uh, really an afterthought. There are lots of cultural taboos that stop people from accessing appropriate services, and the health force does not have good genomics literacy. So if you compare, and this is a stark statistic, that compared to the US and Canada, where uh, they have one genetics provider per 60,000 people. In Pakistan, we unfortunately have one genetics provider per 70 million people. So you can see the challenges in practicing genetics and genomics in our part of the world. Despite that, uh, multiple colleagues all over the country over the last few years have been doing it. And there are three main models by which they do it. One is a community research model. The other is a clinical research model. And finally, a clinical genetics model. I'll highlight each one. So this is where researchers have, uh, uh, you know, from academic institutions, partnered with academic institutions abroad and gone out into the community, identified families of interest with certain phenotypes and basically helped with uh, sequencing them, genotyping them, and then bringing that information back to those communities. And it's been a fairly successful venture, but again, only in certain pockets. Uh, Dr. Huma Chima, our esteemed colleague from Lahore, uh, did uh, this fantastic work where she partnered with a commercial clinical lab, which was offering testing free of cost to families to identify high uh, yield um, uh, uh, loci uh, for genetic disease. And they were very, very successful in, in diagnosing multiple uh, families with rare genetic conditions. Here at AKU uh, in Karachi, we've uh, over a 10 to 12 year period really come up with a multidisciplinary team approach to genetics, which we feel at least in the clinical setting is, is hugely necessary to truly provide high quality genetic services to our country. And this is where the importance of phenotyping comes in because uh, this is where I feel that uh, Dr. Watson needs to take out uh, a leaf from Sherlock Holmes's book and be a very, very strong clue seeker to find the right clues in the family history and all the clinical data uh, that is out there. After that, it's very important to actually use the right language. Uh, and this is where the human phenotype ontology, the HPO, has become the universal language for phenotyping in the genetics community. After that is actually appropriate documentation, because if you don't document and keep your records appropriately, especially in this era of appropriate uh, 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 compliance with uh, med medical ethics standards all over the world, you really need to make sure that you do uh, this uh, very well. We are very fortunate that because of a very strong sample collection network of uh, labs at AKU all over the country, uh, on the background of research sites that are present in multiple areas all over the underserved areas of the country, uh, we're able to cover uh, uh, a large aspect of the population. And this is where uh, one of the big strengths of Pakistan lies, that you have academic centers that have the reach out into the community and there's trust there, which will allow them to uh, really provide this service to the community. Uh, finally, biobanking. Uh, lots of institutions now are, are, are engaging in biobanking. And important thing to note is that this is really very, very important. It should have flawless safety controls and appropriate futuristic thought on how to use those samples. We really need to work together with the international community to bring genes to our own communities in Pakistan and really talk about impact, quality, relevance, and access as the four central pillars 
of all the work that we do. I'd like to thank you and invite you to Pakistan to come and partner with us and other academic institutions to truly bring the genomic revolution to the people who need it the most. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Amr Heather, and I'm very happy to present at the Rare Summit and tell you a little bit about gene equity. So a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Pakistan and have deep roots there. Over 20 years ago, I moved to Silicon Valley where I've been part of companies that have uh, gone public and been acquired. During that same time, I got married. I have three kids and my son, Amin, has achondroplasia. After Amin was born, my wife and I started a nonprofit called growingstronger.org that focuses on improving the quality of medical care for little people. That includes funding uh, research that, that has helped accelerate therapeutics, the development of therapeutics. So I'm uh, looking forward, I'm very excited about the promise of genomic-based precision medicine and how it will help millions of patients and especially thousands and thousands of rare disease patients. And uh, Pakistan has a big role uh, to play in this genomic revolution. However, I see a big problem moving. And that problem is I, uh, I do not see Pakistanis benefiting from the breakthroughs that are happening uh, in Pakistan or the breakthroughs that will be enabled through Pakistanis. And the primary reason why uh, Pakistanis uh, will most likely not benefit from monetary benefit from uh, the, their participation in the genomic revolution is because the equity structure for profit companies does not share any value or equity value with academic institutions and study participants. And we see this as a big problem. What we want to do is create a company that includes and shares the uh, equity with academic institutions and study participants. And we hope this is a trend that we see with more and more uh, genomics data companies. In our particular case, in, gen in uh, our particular case, gen equities case, right from the beginning, uh, we've created two separate equity pools. One is focused on uh, for academic institutions in Pakistan, and one is focused on study participants from, uh, from the general public. And the way it works is that when academic institutions uh, uh, contribute data into the um, uh, into our data repository, uh, we find uh, they get more and more share of that pool. And the same happens with the general public when uh, study participants uh, contribute their uh, genetic data, their uh, genetic data, uh, patient generated health data, uh, their quality of life surveys um, and uh, phenotypic data, they get more and more share of that pool. So in summary, uh, what, uh, we're plan what we will be doing is we will collect uh, genomic and phenotypic data on millions of Pakistanis. Uh, we will monetize this data for the benefit uh, and share that benefit with the Pakistani population, uh, the partners and donors, and of course, our shareholders. So... Um, So uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. And uh, we uh, look forward to hearing from you if you have any feedback or would like to uh, partner with us. I am Harvey Lodish. It is my pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to you about my own experiences in building companies for the diagnosis and treatment of rare diseases and to explain how similar companies in Pakistan can help the country 
solve many of its medical needs and provide treatments to many patients. By way of background, I have been a professor of molecular biology and cellular biology and biological engineering at MIT for over 50 years. I'm also a founding member of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research, where my laboratory is located. I've also been a founder and scientific advisory board member of many biotech companies, beginning in the late 70s, when with seven colleagues at MIT, I helped found Genzyme, a company that I'll explain has pioneered the development of drugs for rare diseases. I've also been the founding chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, a state-supported $1 billion U.S. investment in the development of biotechnology in Massachusetts. Let me begin a bit with Genzyme which is a biotech company which has always focused on rare genetic diseases, both diagnostics and particular novel therapies, also blood disorders, neurology, immunology, and oncology. In 2010, it was the third largest biotechnology company in the world, based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, literally down the street from my laboratories, and it employed more than 11,000 people. It was then acquired as a wholly owned subsidiary of Sanofi. And Genzyme has developed many therapies for treatment of rare diseases. I'll describe the first area of focus, Gaucher disease. And in the past two decades, Genzyme expanded its focus to a number of other rare diseases, including some listed here. For a number of reasons, I'd like to focus for the moment on Gaucher disease. It is a lysosome storage disease. It is an autosomal recessive disease. That is, it needs two inactivating mutations, one inherited from mother and one from the father, in the gene encoding the enzyme beta-glucocerebrosidase, a protein necessary for the degradation of a fatty substance a glycolipid called glucocerebroside. The disease mainly affects peripheral macrophages. It's progressive, debilitating, and sometimes life-threatening. It is most prevalent in descendants of Eastern European Jews, emphasizing a point I will make repeatedly that many of these recessive genetic diseases are found in very specific ethnic groups. It is then internalized by the cells transferred to lysosomes, where it takes up residence and reverses the genetic disease. It was really the first personalized medicine for a rare disease. It's a recombinant protein targeted to a specific type of cell, and it was based on engineering sugars attached to the protein. This is one of the reasons I wanted to explain the initial product of Genzyme. The second is that a rare disease is rare, can be rare, unless it's in your family. At the time we developed this drug, I had no idea that the mutations for Gaucher disease were in my family. As it happens, one of my seven grandchildren has Gaucher disease. Since Andrew was 10 years old, he has been treated with the Genzyme drug that his grandfather helped develop. And I'm pleased to report that Andrew has just started college. You see him on the left of this figure when he was in the middle of a cross United States bicycle trip. He had to pause twice, once in Oklahoma and once in California, to get infusions of the Gaucher drug. I described TVARD Biosciences, which is a company to develop gene therapies for Dravet syndrome and many other disorders, particularly those of the central nervous system, that cannot be treated by conventional gene therapies. 
I co-founded the company with two gentlemen, businessmen, not scientists, who are founders of children with Drave. And uh, we are using transfer RNAs to develop a number of therapies for these diseases. Um, importantly, a lot of advances in basic science, particularly most recently the draft of the human genome sequence, and now of course the complete, complete human genome sequence, has given rise to many types of new therapies. Therapies based on oligonucleotides, gene therapies, cell therapies, that offer the promise of treating many unmet medical needs in our children. Um, as mentioned, about 9% of the Southeast Asian population suffer from rare diseases, most of which are genetic in origin and could even be higher. There are a number of reasons that will be obvious to the audience why management of these diseases is very difficult in Asia. Socioeconomic disparities, particularly a lack of genetic research and expertise, low awareness by the medical community, and really lack of momentum in acknowledging and addressing the unmet needs of patients. Um, to emphasize the point of ethnicity, here I list a number of genetic diseases that are prominent in Caucasians. Very few of these are found in any abundance in African or Asian populations. And in fact, very few genetic diseases common in African and Asian populations have been studied at all. And as I pointed out, none of these uh, have genetic analysis. Most of them have no appropriate treatment options. And as example, uh, there are prenatal tests for a number of diseases affecting Ashkenazic or Eastern European and uh, Western European Sephardic Jews. Importantly, these tests are administered by the religious leaders in these religious communities, the rabbis. And many of the genetic diseases common in these populations, such as Tay-Sachs, have been eliminated virtually in one generation by prenatal testing. And this, of course, provides an important opportunity for Pakistan and other Asian countries. Um, in general, large pharmaceutical companies do not focus on drugs for rare diseases. And as in the United States, there are huge opportunities for developing countries to build the infrastructure to analyze genetic causes of rare diseases common in their ethnic populations and to foster the growth and development of companies that can produce prenatal genetic tests and eventually develop therapies. There's a huge opportunity for understanding and curing their diseases worldwide. I list my email because I'm happy to correspond with really anyone uh, who's interested in further information. And I also point out a course that I teach at MIT with colleagues in the Sloan School of Management. It's online as an edX course, the science and business of biotechnology. Uh, it's had over 24,000 students. And I would be delighted if any of the audience would attend these lectures. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody. Uh, it is Dr. Abdul Rashid. Director Davian of Pharmacy Services and Chairman of Clinical Study Committee, Davian of Pakistan, Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan, Ministry of National Health Services, Regulation and Coordination. Uh, basically, my major is pharmacy. I have done PhD from China and I am proud that I am the first pharmacist who has done uh, first time in the history, uh, not only as a Pakistani, but also as a first PhD student in China in pharmacy subject. I have also the experience of, as a president of Pharmacy Council of Pakistan, 
uh, as far as trap is concerned the drug regulatory authority act has been promulgated in 2012 bio study rules 2017 was notified and it is mandatory for uh, clinical trial sites contact research organizations and clinical laboratories to obtain mandatory license for to be a part of any clinical trial either it is investigational or observational the applicants must have to take approval from institutional review board and also they have to take the approval from national bioethics committee the clinical trials its monitoring and oversight activities are carried out by clinical study committee and i am head of that committee which falls under the to be in of pharmacy services draft in clinical studies there is pharmacologist clinician biostatisticians pharmacists and regulators and the nominations are the representation of the in uh, biomedical sciences as far as the time of the approval is concerned national biotech committee they take a time of 72 hours and it may be from 2 to 3 days moreover the ethical application and its approval the time is just two weeks and approval from drug regulatory authority of pakistan is concerned it is just four weeks so on behalf of Cl clinical study committee drug regulatory authority of pakistan ministry of national health services regulation coordinations i assure you that if application is complete from all respects it means that after approval of irb and also the approval of national biotech committee the draft takes only 4 weeks for approval of any clinical trial or clinical study uh as far as the after approval we have made a national drug safety monitoring board they monitoring they monitor the all the approval uh, clinical studies and there is also the monitoring of any either adverse event for immunization for covid for vaccine or any adr conducted during the study the adr is also reporting is also mandatory and it is collected in drug regulatory authority of pakistan clinical trial must be conducted for rare diseases and there is a fast pace of recruitment to the subjects and i it is mandated and also i will um, urge to mention and it is for your information that pakistan is a fifth populous country of the world having more than 220 million population a very diff diversified areas we clinical study committee has approved and adopted the ics guidelines and also the who guidelines so in pakistan the clinical trials are conducted at as per international standards all the last 
guidelines, rules, SOPs are available on dra.gov.pk website. All the information are available on DRAP website. Moreover, Drug Regulatory Authority Pakistan has adopted US clinical trials.gov and all the approved clinical trials can be seen on the US clinical trial.gov site. We welcome you that you can conduct the clinical trials either in allopathic human medicines, veterinary medicines, COVID vaccines, COVID, COVID treatment medicines, medical devices, herbal medicines, medicated cosmetics and blood and blood products except food we conduct all the clinical trials. Uh, I want to add something about that uh, nine patients are available in Pakistan and the rare diseases which are the problem in Pakistan is Goshe, Pemphe and Leishmania. So as I have mentioned that Pakistan is a huge population uh, and having a population of 220 individuals. So there are many rare diseases. I cannot mention here the names, but I want to tell you that for conducting clinical trials and on now patients and, 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 uh, and uh, clinic of, and for conducting clinical trials on rare diseases. This is a country where you can find subjects very easily and I urge you to the uh, developed countries that they should conduct the clinical trials and welcome you being a chairman of the clinical study committee drug Regulatory of Pakistan to conduct clinical studies on rare disease in Pakistan. Hello, I'm Dr. Jawad Gill from DRK Pharma Solutions, and today I'm talking about rare diseases and clinical research op opportunities in rare diseases from CRO perspective. A brief introduction of myself. I'm a clinical research professional since 1997. I've worked with leading global pharma companies and CROs in Asia Pacific, Africa, Mid-East, and Central Asia. Currently, I'm heading clinical operations at DRK Pharma Solutions. Why Pakistan is a good place to conduct clinical research in rare diseases? That's because Pakistan being the sixth largest population with over 220 million people and having treatment, treatment live patients is the mainstay of clinical research uh, in our regional focus. There are very uh, qualified investigators sites having very good infrastructure and no competing studies. There, there, are, there is dedicated site staff to manage studies at the site. And investigator usually have international experience in clinical trials. In Pakistan, there is high disease burden of rare diseases. That is because of very frequent um, intermarriages and families. And deaths due to rare diseases are highest among children in Pakistan after infectious diseases and malnutrition. Pakistan has experienced clinical research professionals who are able to manage and monitor clinical trials with high standards of compliance with GCP and on international standards following international regulations. In the regulatory landscape in Pakistan uh, is very supportive for clinical trial activities because of the re because of relatively short approval timelines. Government policies are very supportive for develop for developing clinical research industry in Pakistan. And regulatory authorities keep necessary oversight on all active clinical trials and research activities. So the summary of my discussion today is that there is high incidence of rare disease 
there are very suitable sites with good good infrastructure and uh, highly qualified investigators. Clinical research professionals in Pakistan are very experienced and well trained, and government policies are very supportive for clinical trials in Pakistan, and they keep necessary oversight on uh, all all activities on all active clinical trials. So thank you very much for uh, for listening to my presentation. Thanks and goodbye.